Hello everyone, uh, good evening. Welcome to our, our very special Facebook Live question and answer session with Dr. John Mason of the South Downs Planetarium. Welcome, Dr. John. Um, in addition to this event this evening, Dr. John and his team at the South Downs Planetarium have created and produced a couple of really wonderful films as part of this year's Dark Skies Festival. And if you haven't checked them out yet, I would really highly recommend both of them. You can find them on the South Downs National Park YouTube channel. Um, there's one film that explores the winter night skies and, and is a really wonderful tour of what's up there at the moment on a clear night. We've had some good ones recently. Uh, and uh, today's film um, is looking at what is going on in uh, current space exploration. And I watched it earlier and was really inspired by it. Um, so we have lots of questions for Dr. John today, um, and please feel free to drop any more in in the comments section on the Facebook Live, and we will try and get to them. Um, so as today's film is about space exploration, I was thinking maybe we could start there. And there's lots of very exciting things going on in space exploration at the moment, now and in the near future. And one of the questions we have received is whether there are plans to return people to the moon. So Dr. John, for those who haven't seen the film yet, uh, what is the short answer to this question and why do we want to go to the moon? Well, yes, uh, there are definitely plans to go back to the moon. Um, when I was growing up, uh, of course, it was at the time of the space race, which led into the Apollo moon landings. And um, that was a really inspiring time to be interested in astronomy and space. And uh, I think that in a way, having a, a focus like that is really good for people getting an interest, not just in astronomy and space, but in engineering and science in, in general. And of course, it's 49 over 49 years ago since the last people left the moon in December 1972 uh, Jack Schmidt and Eugene Cernan and uh, now we are about to go back and all being well by the end of April the return to the moon will be underway now to do this of course you need to build rockets spacecraft you need to train your astronauts you've got to work out how the missions are going to go on. The rocket that is going to be doing the, the very first flight is the Space Launch System. It's a new NASA launch rocket, 322 feet tall compared to 363 for the giant Saturn V that we had way back in the uh, 1960s. And it's carrying the Orion capsule. That is the new crew module that will take the astronauts to the moon. So the first flight, which is hopefully going to be, as I say, before the end of April, is an uncrewed test of the rocket, the Iran capsule, or all of the communications and infrastructure around it. And it's going to be a 26 day mission. So the rocket will blast off, it will head off to the moon, it will go around the moon, it'll then go into a, an unusual orbit around the moon that's about 70,000 kilometers beyond the moon. And then come back using the moon's gravity again, and then come back to Earth. So a three and a half week mission and that is due to take place very soon. Now, the astronauts who will be flying these missions are already in training. And of course, one of the things that many people have said is, why is it that we've had no woman on the moon, no person of color on the moon? And that is all going to change because there are a lot of astronauts in training who will be part of those missions. And uh, I suspect that the very next person to set foot on the moon, moon will be a woman. Um, now, when that's going to be, we're not too sure because there will be a gap between this first test flight, the uh, Artemis 1 launch, and the first crewed launch. And the first crewed launch will be not quite a, a, a reprise of, of the first test flight, but it will have a crew on board, they will go to the moon, they'll fly around the moon, they'll come back again, do various things on the way, testing everything out. And then, possibly after that, we will start to look at how we would land people on the moon. Now, this requires a lot of infrastructure. The thing about this return to the moon, is gonna be quite different to the six Apollo flights in that we're going to have uh, obviously new lunar landers. Uh, people will be perhaps uh, living in bases on the moon. We will have a space station in orbit around the moon called the Lunar Gateway. And there are a number of commercial companies 
who will be involved in this. Uh, unlike in the 1960s, when this is entirely a US space agency led uh, initiative, a government led initiative, if you like, commercial partners will play a crucial role in this new exploration. The moon is our nearest neighbor in space, our partner in space. It's the obvious place to go and explore. And we've learned a great deal, not only about the moon, but the relationship between the Earth and the moon, the Earth-Moon system, as we call it, the history of the planets, the solar system. And bases on the moon will be a fact of, I would say, maybe not the 2020s, but the 2030s, definitely. And those bases will have scientific people living there doing various projects. But also, I think we're going to be seeing commercial exploitation of the moon. There's a lot of interest in using the resources on the moon for the betterment, hopefully, of everyone on Earth. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. Um, so I think it's going to be a really good focus for young people to get interested in science, technology, engineering, mathematics astronomy and space in general, just as I was all that long time ago. That's great. Thanks, John. Uh, Artemis, by the way, was the twin sister of Apollo. Oh, it's yes. Great name. It fits really nicely with the Apollo program of before. That, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful link. Thanks, John. So um, obviously one of the things that, that sometimes gets talked about is um, we need to diversify off the Earth onto other planets. And certainly one of the things that you mentioned in your space exploration film was this uh, mission to look at an asteroid and how we might defend the planet against an asteroid coming towards it. Um, so we have had a question from Austin, aged 11, and he asks, apart from Mars um, and the moon, presumably, if an asteroid were heading towards the Earth and we would have to evacuate, which planet or moon would be the best to terraform? Well, first of all, I think that if an asteroid is heading for the Earth, the last thing we're going to do is evacuate. I think the first thing we're going to do is try and get all the, the brains together and work as a team to say, OK, how are we going to deal with this? And if Bruce Willis isn't available that day, we're going to have to come up with another way of solving it. And this is where the DART mission that I talk about in the video is important, because if an asteroid is heading towards us, and we're, we're probably talking a fairly small one, one about the size of a city centre, maybe 100, 150 metres in diameter. If an asteroid of that size is heading our way and it's definitely going to hit us, there are various things. Now, the first thing is, do you blow it up? And the answer is almost certainly no, because you then create a cloud of debris and you don't know where any of it's going. The best thing to do is to try and nudge it off course. And if you do this in the right way, you don't have to apply a very big acceleration to change the orbit of the object and make it fly by harmlessly. And that is where this new mission is, is really involved in trying to see how easy would it be to nudge an asteroid off course. Now, we don't really know what all of them are made of. You need to know how massive they are, how dense they are, what are they made of? Are they solid monolithic bodies or are they piles of rubble held together by gravity? All these things make a difference between how you deal with the threat. However, we will, whether there's an asteroid threat or not, want to live on other worlds. And Austin mentions both the moon and Mars, and those are the obvious two places to go. If we look at the other places, now, on the moon, of course, there's no atmosphere, so you're going to have, it's going to be life in a bubble, but I'm sure that we will have bases on the moon where people will live for months at a time. In fact, a lot of people perhaps would say they'd be quite happy living on the moon for a few months rather than on Earth. On Mars, it's actually quite similar because although Mars has a very, very thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide, only about 150th of the pressure of the air at the surface of the Earth, Again, it's not somewhere you can live outside. You're going to need a full pressure suit like on the moon. You're going to need to again live in a bubble. 
But I suspect that on Mars, because the journey times are quite long, you can get to the moon in three days, go there and back in a week. But a trip to Mars, nine months there, nine months to come back, a few months on the surface, you're looking at two years. And that means we're going to have to cope with that time by having bases where people can live. We're going to have to think of how we supply them, how we're going to give them air, food, water. We may even grow our own food on the surface of Mars in greenhouses or something. That's not impossible. But if we look elsewhere, there isn't very many places we can go. Mercury, very close to the sun, like the moon, no atmosphere but extremely hot in the day, bitterly cold at night, and really hard to see how you could have a comfortable environment on a base on Mercury. It's a good place to set up robotic observatories for studying the sun, that's very important, but probably not a great place to live. Venus, you wanna give it a very wide berth. It may be named after the goddess of beauty and love, but there's nothing beautiful or lovely about it at all. Because the atmosphere, 90 times the pressure of the air at the surface of the Earth, choking carbon dioxide laced with sulfuric acid and poisonous gases like phosphine, and down on the surface, the temperature about 480 degrees C, crush by the pressure and slide by the heat, poisoned by the gases. You can't see the human explorers we go there and set up a base, come somewhere for robots. If you go beyond Mars, you've got the gas giants. You can't land on a gas giant like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. You could land on some of their moons. But again, Jupiter is surrounded by belts of deadly radiation. You've got to keep away from them. So the options are limited. We might have people on asteroids, maybe mining them for all the precious metals they contain. But I don't think terraforming is really an option because the reason the moon has no atmosphere and the reason Mars has very little is because they're a lot smaller than Earth and their gravity is a lot less than ours. In the case of the moon, only one sixth gravity. In the case of Mars, roughly a third gravity. And they've lost most of their atmospheres to space. In the case of the moon, lost virtually all of it. In the case of Mars, lost most of it. And so if you're going to start to try and terraform it, as fast as you make an atmosphere, it's going to leak away into space. So I don't think terraforming planets is really an option in our solar system. So Earth is the place we have got. That's our home. There is nowhere as good. There's nowhere better in our solar system. We've just got to learn to look after it. But more important than that, we've got to learn to live with each other. Because looking after our planet is a global problem that we've all got to take seriously. And everybody has a shared responsibility in that. And at the moment, some people take more of a responsibility than others. So terraforming, I'm afraid not. Great. Kim Stanley Robinson, if you've not read the three books of Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, you should definitely read them. But Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, but I don't think it's going to happen. Thanks, Dr. John. Yeah, there's been a lot in, uh, in, I can think of several science fiction novels where they talk about terraforming Mars, but uh, perhaps we'll put that on the back burner for now. And uh... <laughs> maybe in a Maybe in a few hundred years, we might think of ways of doing it. Planetary engineering um, involves a lot of things. For example, people have talked about putting a, you know, a sphere around a planet, making, making another planet around a planet, and being able to fill that with an atmosphere. Um, but those sorts of planetary engineering projects are on such a colossal scale that you can't imagine how they would be funded, how they would be brought about in realistic terms. Great. Well, something to, to think about for the future, but let's focus on getting to Moon and getting to Mars first and protecting our planet. Absolutely, yes, um, from all sorts of things. Um, so as we have just been talking about asteroids, we did have a question about what is the difference between comets, meteors and asteroids? Okay. Well, I'm going to bang into their meteorites while we're at it. Brilliant. 
because there was a wonderful auction at Christie's in New York today where meteorite samples were going for ridiculous sums of money. Really small lumps of meteorite were going for ridiculous sums of money. A meteorite, of course, is a piece of rock from space lands on the surface of the Earth. So let's start off with asteroids. Asteroids are lumps of rock that mainly inhabit the zone between Mars and Jupiter. There's over 850,000 of them in that region, and they're basically bits of rock that never really made a planet. A large asteroid would be the size of Sussex. There are a few that are bigger, but an asteroid the size of Sussex would be reasonably large. And there are many, the majority, in fact, as I said earlier, are the size of a city centre. Now, those asteroids, although they're mainly in the asteroid belt, their orbits are perturbed by the gravity, particularly of giant Jupiter, and they can be perturbed into Mars crossing orbits and eventually Earth crossing orbits, and then those asteroids have the potential to threaten Earth. But small fragments of asteroids, bits that may be, I don't know, five, 10 meters across, maybe the size of a minivan or a bus, those are coming into the atmosphere all the time. The vast majority of them completely burn up and maybe only a tiny piece reaches the ground as a meteorite. So meteorites are related to fragments from asteroids and many of the meteorites that we found can be related directly to asteroids that we observe or families of asteroids in the asteroid belt. Now comets are rather different. Comets are largely made of ice. In fact, what we call dirty ice. Ice with dust mixed in. Now, beyond the planets, beyond Neptune, beyond the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt, which is the region of icy bodies that contains Pluto, beyond there, there is a vast swarm of small, dirty dust balls, dirty, icy snowballs, that sort of thing. And when one of and these are no bigger than a city centre either, most of them. And when they fall in towards the sun, they get warmed up and eventually they get a fuzzy head and they grow tails, a nice blue fluorescing tail of gas and a broad curving yellowy tail of billions of grains of dust released from the dirty ice ball. And in the old days, they were called hairy stars. That's where the word comet comes from, hairy star. They look like a star with hair growing out. So comets are icy visitors from far beyond the solar system. As I said, one of those tails contains billions of grains of dust. And every time a comet goes round the sun, and some are periodic, like Halley's Comet, others come round once and won't be back for hundreds of thousands, millions of years. The dust tail of a comet is continually producing dust, which gets strewn along the orbit of the comet. So long after the comet's gone by, it leaves a dusty trail behind it. And if the Earth happens to plough through the dusty trail of a comet's tail, those grains of dust are pulled into the Earth's atmosphere by gravity. They burn up high in the atmosphere. And we're talking 50, 60 miles above the ground, typically. And that's what we call a meteor or shooting star. And they do not reach the ground. They are completely incinerated in the upper atmosphere. And you can go out, you can watch a meteor shower. There are some really nice ones during the year. There's a very nice one in the middle of August, another one in the middle of December, about two weeks before Christmas. And those meteor showers can be interesting to watch. But no fragments that are burning up in a meteor shower will come anywhere near the ground. They're completely incinerated because the fragments are very small maybe no larger than a pea in size. But the fragments that lead to meteorite falls are rocky material, they are larger, and they are not completely incinerated sometimes in their passage into the atmosphere. So asteroids, meteorites, comets, meteors, or shooting stars. Meteor, grain of dust burning up in the upper atmosphere. Meteorite, lump of rock that you can find on the ground. But judging by the auction in New York today, are a lot more valuable than we perhaps thought. To science, they're incredibly valuable. And I must admit, I'm always a little bit 
in two minds as to whether we should be you know selling these fragments as commodities because they have a very important scientific story to tell but people find them and they are worth what people are willing to pay yes i think there was some evidence uh, many years ago about one that potentially come from mars mm. and that are, so some of them are very rarely um have actually come off the surface of mars many billions of yeah. years ago and whereas uh, it's quite true that's a good point because whereas the vast majority of meteorites do come from the asteroid belt there are a small number mm -hmm. that come from the surface of mars now there have been huge impacts on the surface of mars in the past that blasted martian rocks into space some of which have made their way to the earth and fallen to earth as so-called martian meteorites or snc meteorites and there's a small number of those and they are very valuable and also we do have a few lunar meteorites we know there are huge impacts that occurred on the moon you can see the craters with telescope binoculars and some of those have blasted out fragments that have landed on earth and those are lunar meteorites so those are really the three sorts we get from the asteroid belt the vast majority some from mars and a few from the moon fabulous thank you dr john um, so we have had a question actually sticking with the moon. Um, so obviously Earth has a moon. Um, why don't any of the other inner planets have a moon? And why do a lot of the outer planets have lots of moons? Is there is that something that's obvious to talk about or do we not know about yeah, it? Yeah, well, well, um, we don't know why Mercury and Venus have no moons. Um, neither of them do. Um, that's the way it is. Um, Venus uh, spins very slowly backwards and we have to try and explain why that is the case and we don't really know why so um, whether some something happened to Venus in the past we don't know but what is interesting is the fact that actually Mercury Venus Earth and Mars probably none of them had moons when they were formed Mercury and Venus still don't Earth was hit by a large rocky planetoid when it was about 50, 60 million years old. That blasted rock into space, some of which clumped together to make our moon. And we have an unusually big moon considering Earth is a fairly small planet. Mars's moons are almost certainly captured asteroids, rocks that wandered by that were captured by Mars's gravity. So it's probable that none of those four inner planets had moons when they were formed. But they were collected in the case of Earth and Mars by different processes. And in the case of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, you are talking very large, massive objects. Jupiter, particularly, 320 times the mass of the Earth, an enormous object, very massive, very powerful gravity. When those outer planets were formed with rocky cores or cores of rock and ice, and then they gathered these huge gaseous envelopes around over a period of maybe a couple of hundred million years. There was stuff left over from the formation of those planets that formed disks of stuff around the forming planet. And many of the moons would have formed from that material because, because these planets were because these planets were um, very, very massive and had strong gravity, um, they collected a lot of material. In addition, we know that those four giant planets also picked up objects passing by. In the outer parts of both Jupiter and Saturn's moon systems, there are quite large numbers of so-called retrograde moons, moons that are going around the planet the wrong way compared with all the others. And many of those are almost certainly, if not all, captured objects. So in the case of the outer planets, they've got a lot of moons because they were big, and had a powerful gravity, but they've also picked up and collected a lot of moons on the way in the history of the solar system of objects passing by. There are over 200 moons altogether in the solar system. Currently, Saturn is the league leader with 82, uh, Jupiter not far behind with 80, and then we've got uh, Uranus 27 and Neptune 14. But the interesting thing is that Neptune has a smaller number because its largest moon, Triton, is also a captured object. 
the Triton was captured into a wrong way orbit. And as Triton came into the Neptunian system, it created mayhem and it may have booted out many moons that were originally there, leaving only a smaller reduced number. So the solar, we, we, you know, we get used to the fact the solar system is a, um, a very stable, very steady vista. We look at it and things are unchanging. But over the history, the four and a half thousand million year history of our solar system, things have been changing all the time. Objects colliding with others, objects being captured, changing their orbits, this sort of thing. And so, um, you know, we end up with the solar system we end up because it's evolved to be that way. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, so sticking with the solar system, uh, we were wondering when we look at picture images of the planets from telescopes and from the explorers that have gone out to the other planets, they often um, have different colours. So Neptune often looks very blue in the images that came back from the Voyager probes. Um, Jupiter has obviously got that wonderful banding. Um, Venus is very kind of beige with some with some banding. Mars is very red. Why are the planets different colours and do they actually have those colours or is that something that, that we sort of put on them? Right, the first thing we need to get very clear is that when you look at images of planets, not all of them are in real colour. They're in what's called false colour. And scientists do this, they take an image of a planet and put it in Photoshop or equivalent and change the balance of colour or the colours to bring out certain details. And sometimes when you look at pictures of objects in books, the colours you see are not actually the real colour that you would see if you were, you know, if you were travelling towards those planets in a spaceship and you looked out of the window, you know, how would they look with the, with the human eye? That's something I think we need to always get a, an idea of. What would they look like? Now, most of the pictures of Mercury and the Moon are pretty much like they are because they are greyish, shades of grey heavily cratered shades of grey. They don't have a lot of colour. They have a little bit of colour. The colours are very, very subtle. But in general, they are shades of grey. Now, Venus, the vast majority of pictures you see of Venus were made in ultraviolet light. And they show very subtle cloud features. But actually, when you look at Venus through a telescope, it doesn't look like that. The cloud layer generally is very bright and any shadings are very very subtle and in fact the Japanese space agency JAXA released a picture of Venus which is often the one I show in talks because it's the right color for what you'd see if you were flying towards it. It's a very bright brilliantly highly reflective layer of cloud with these very subtle shadings in it. Mars is definitely red. It's the colour of rust because iron oxide is present in the surface minerals, so it really is a reddy brown colour. But again, when you look at pictures, the degree of reddy brown changes. If you go back to the mid 1970s to the Viking landers, they were very much a, a bright pinky colour. And now, when you look at the perseverance images of the surface of Mars, it's nowhere near as lurid pink. It's a much more brick red or uh, reddy brown colour. Um, and that's probably much more like the real colour. So as camera technology and techniques have improved, we've improved our ability to get the accurate colours in the images. But, and we show this in our film, actually, we show the difference between the real colours of Mars and the colours that scientists change things to, to bring out the information and the detail. Because when we're looking at a landscape, it often helps us to change the colour to bring out interesting features. And that's what we do with that. Now, in the case of the gas giants, they have different colours because the gases in the atmosphere, atmospheres vary from one planet to the other. The temperatures of those clouds vary. The cloud tops get colder the further you go from the sun. Although interesting, Uranus and Neptune have a very similar temperature in the cloud tops. For Jupiter, it's about minus 150 degrees at the cloud tops. Saturn, about minus 180. Uh, 
Uranus and Neptune about minus 220, very similar, even though that Neptune is nearly twice as far away as Uranus. Um, so the temperatures are important. But of course, as you go into the planet's body, the temperature rises, the pressure rises. So the conditions of temperature and pressure affect the state of gases in the atmosphere. That will affect colours. And so when you look at Jupiter, it is a fairly highly coloured planet. It's a really good thing to look at Jupiter on a really clear night. And you can can see colour. You can see the fact that there are dark browny cloud belts, there are brighter zones, the red spot looks a sort of reddy orangey colour, and you do have other, you have pure white spots as well. So I always think Jupiter is probably the most varied planet in terms of its colour, because you need a good night to see it. Saturn, the colours are more subtle, more yellow, more brown, uh, and there's a layer of haze around Saturn's atmosphere that makes the detail harder to pick out. So the belts, the stripy cloud belts on Saturn are nowhere near as well defined as they are on Jupiter. They're still there. And again, with special cameras and techniques, we can bring them out. But again, you'll see pictures in books where the colors are enhanced. The rings are variable. They are not all the same color throughout. Um, the B ring, for example, is very bright, almost white. The A ring is more grayish and the C ring the same. So there are these subtle differences in shading. Uranus is probably uh, a greeny blue, blue with a hint of green. But again, there's not much in the way of weather there. There's not so much in the way of stripy cloud belts or individual clouds. Neptune, again, in all the pictures, appears rather more blue than Uranus, and it does have quite a lot of weather. So Changes in composition, changes in temperature, changes in the state of the gases in the atmosphere, all affects at the colours we see. It's very important to realise that very often the pictures you see are enhanced in some way and the colours are not what you would see if you were looking out the window as you flew towards it. Maybe one day we will. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> Go sure. Go and see them with our own eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we can now, we, we can have... Uh, robots that can have cameras on that are exactly the same wavelength sensitivity as the eye and human senses can be taken out into space with virtual presence. Wonderful. Um, so we have had a question going back to the moons, um, which I think is quite an interesting question. How big does a moon need to be in order to be called a moon? So what, what defines a moon? And I think this is quite interesting because obviously like the Earth moons, like you were saying, the, Earth, the Earth's moon is quite big for Earth being a relatively small planet. And you can almost start to see it as a binary planet system. So Indeed you can. Um, now, for example, if the Earth was the size of a soccer ball, the moon would be the size of a tennis ball. So it's quite a big moon relative to the Earth. Jupiter, which is an enormous planet, its largest moon, Ganymede, is obviously very small compared with Jupiter, but it's bigger than the planet Mercury. But we call it a moon because it's going round a planet. Saturn has a big moon called Titan, which is the only moon in the solar system with substantial atmosphere with a thick layer of cloud, and that too is bigger than the planet Mercury. So for the larger objects, it's fairly easy to say, well, that's a moon because it's going round a planet. But then as you get to smaller and smaller sizes, it becomes a bit more complicated because no one has ever answered the question. I've asked it at a number of conferences when we've had spacecraft missions to say Saturn. Now, Saturn has 82 moons and some of them are quite small, only a few tens of miles across. And then you see the rings. Now, the rings are made up of billions of tiny fragments of rock and ice, some of which are no bigger than grains of sand, some of which will be the size of Chichester Cathedral, and some of which we believe may be a bit bigger than that, might even be a mile across. So we're getting to this rather uh, fuzzy zone between a large ring particle, a moonlet, which would be a very small moon orbiting around the planet, maybe within the rings, maybe beyond, 
and something that we call the moon. And there isn't really a dictionary definition to show between them. It's one of the things that, you know, it's a, it's a muddy area, it's a gray area. Speaking of muddy areas in the solar system, um, one question that we have come across during our festival is about Pluto. Dear, oh. lovely Pluto. And I certainly grew, grew up when it was a planet, um, mm. the way I remember the, the, the planets. My very early morning jam sandwich usually nauseates people, is the, is the mnemonic I use to remember the, the planets. But of course, Pluto has now been um, downgraded, maybe. to be. No, don't warm. use that word. You won't use downgrade. It's been downgrade redefined. Isn't a fair description. Pluto is an amazing object. And in fact, by changing the category of Pluto, we made it more important, not less important, because we used to know of three regions in our solar system. The inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, the asteroid belt and the gas giants, which you could divide into two, Jupiter and Saturn, and the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And then beyond, a long, long way, was the Oort cloud of comets. But then in between Neptune and the Oort cloud, we have this region, the Edgeworth Kuiper belt, which is icy bodies that were left over when the solar system was formed. It's extremely cold out there. And Pluto was the first object in that region to be discovered. And it was really a case of ignorance that we called it a planet to start with, because when we discovered Pluto, we actually thought it was bigger than the Earth. And over time, we realized not only was it very small, but it wasn't on its own out there. It was part of a vast swarm of icy objects of which Pluto was just the first one to be found. And there are thousands more still out there, but they're very faint. You need a big telescope to see them and discover them. And the time on big telescopes is limited and they're doing other important jobs. And although we found some, there are many, many more waiting to be discovered. Pluto is part of a big club, but it's the most important member of the club because it was the first member of that club. And yes, we call it a dwarf planet now because we've learned about its place in the solar system but it's a very important place. And it's not less important than anything else. It's just as important, it's just different. And the fact we call it a different name doesn't make it any less important. When the first asteroids were discovered, they were called planets. Then they were called minor planets. And then we said, well, they're asteroids. And there is one dwarf planet inside the asteroid belt, but it's still an asteroid really. So planets are objects which are orbiting on their own, maybe with a moon system, but they're not part of a vast swarm of similar objects. All the eight planets, apart from two, have moons, and they're orbiting the sun on their own with the moons, but they're not part of a big club of similar objects. Whereas the asteroids are, and Pluto in the edge with Kuiper belt is as well. So it makes sense with our current knowledge of the solar system. I do think, however, that we might find another planet out there one day, an object that we would generally call a planet because it's not part of a swarm of similar objects and it's orbiting the sun, maybe a long, long way out, but no one's ever seen it. And uh, until they do, and until we can work out its orbit, no one will know for sure. <clears throat> so Pluto essentially demonstrates that our knowledge of the solar system has is increasing. So calling it a dwarf planet, like you say, is not about making it less than it is, but it's really about the fact that um, we've discovered more exciting stuff about the solar system and Pluto can really be held up as a poster child for that discovery. Yeah, absolutely. And, and always when I do a tour of the planets, I include Pluto, even though it's not a planet, because I include the major moons of the planets. And I talk about Pluto because it is the, in, you know, it's the first member of this exclusive club of the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt.
Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so um, just uh, again, just coming back to asteroids, we've been asked, what is your favourite kind of asteroid? Uh, do you like the iron meteorites? Do you like, um, it says lu Luna, so I suppose the, uh, yeah. The, my favourite meteorite type is probably the iron meteorites. And, and one of the reasons is that when you give them to people, and they feel them in their hand, they go, oh, wow, that's heavy. Whereas you give them a chondrite, a stony meteorite, and it looks like a piece of rock. Mm. When you give them an iron meteorite with the, the regmaglyphs, the like thumbprint marks in it, and they feel it, they think, oh, yeah, that feels heavy. Now, of course, chondrites are the most common sort of meteorite. Stony meteorites are the most common. Iron meteorites are not so common. But nonetheless, they are the ones that impress people the most when you give them, them to hold in their hand. So we're all. Uh, I don't really have a favourite asteroid. I mean, there are uh, eight hundred fifty thousand plus to choose from, but I do have an asteroid of my own. Um, the asteroid John Mason is out there somewhere beyond the orbit of Mars, and it was discovered by a, a lovely lady called Eleanor He Lin who I met many times uh, over the years. She, she's dead now, sadly. But she discovered this asteroid, and its designation was uh, something, something JM, which was my initials. Uh, and she um, got the governing body of world astronomy to name it after me, which is incredibly kind of her. So I've not, you know, I don't know what happens if one day someone goes and sets up a, a mine on this asteroid and starts making lots of money from it. Whether I'll be able to take them to court and say you've got to pay me a share, I have no idea. Super. Well, let's say uh, yes. Something to worry about in the future, perhaps. Your <laughs> retirement. This lady. Um, so yes, we've spent all this time talking about the planets, but the, the, the biggest part of the solar system we haven't mentioned yet is, of course, our star, the sun. And um, a question we quite often get asked is, um, how long, how old is the sun and how much longer is it going to live? Well, it's in round figures. If the planets are 4,500 million years old, the sun is obviously a bit older than that. So approaching 5,000 million years, because the sun was formed first from a great cloud of gas and dust. Around that was a slowly turning disk of dust and gas and pebbles and boulders. The planets were made from that. The rocky planets close in where the temperature was highest. Then the asteroids, the bits left over. Then the gas giants, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, and the icy stuff furthest out where the temperature was coldest. So the sun has been around for nearly 5,000 million years, and it's roughly middle age. So it'll go on for about another almost 5,000 million years. But in its later stages, it will change. Because in the core of the sun, where the temperatures and pressures are enormous, a process called nuclear fusion is going on. Now the sun is roughly three quarters hydrogen, roughly a quarter helium, and a small amount of heavier elements. And deep in the core of the sun, Hydrogen is being fused to helium in a continuous chain reaction. Every second, 600 million tonnes of hydrogen is converted to 596 million tonnes of helium every second. And the missing 4 million tonnes of mass is converted to energy. Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, tells us. And the 4 million tonnes of mass times the square of the speed of light gives a very big amount of energy. And that's what keeps the sun shining. Eventually, the hydrogen in the core will run out. And the sun will start to fuse the hydrogen in shells around the core. And when that happens, the temperature inside will increase and the sun will expand. It'll become a star called a red giant, 100, 200 times bigger than it is today. The red giant will be unstable. It'll be pulsating. It'll be brightening and fading over a period, maybe of a year or so. Eventually, it will shrug off its outer layers in a series of shells. The white hot core will be exposed, and that will shrink and pull and fade a dying ember, a white dwarf. And eventually, the white dwarf itself will fade, and we will then have a dead dark star, 
where a number of dead dark planets will be going around it, probably including the Earth. And that will be maybe 7,000 million years from now. So yes, the sun will die, but it's nothing to worry about. It's a long way off. It certainly is. Brilliant. So we've, we've, we've got the sun, we've got the planets and the asteroid belts, the inner planets, the asteroid belt, the uh, outer planets, Kuiper belt, Oort cloud. Um, where does the solar system end? Ah, that is a question that's been probed by the two Voyager spacecraft Voyagers 1 and 2 that were launched in 1977, uh, Voyager 1 passed Jupiter and Saturn and the largest moon Titan, and then went out the solar system going upwards. Voyager 2 passed Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and then went out the solar system. And those two Voyagers have both now reached interstellar space. And we define that as where the magnetic influence of the sun and what we call the solar wind, which is a continuous stream of gas and particles flowing out from the sun, where that blends into the interstellar medium. And, and certainly with the case of Voyager 2, it's about 100 times the Earth's sun distance from the sun. So in that direction, it's about 100 times the Earth's sun distance. In this direction, it's rather less, um, but that's the extent of the sun's influence. And that is very much less than obviously the distances to the next nearest star. I mean, it would take thousands and thousands of years at the speed of the voyages to get to the next nearest star. And that's, it's about in light years, that's about, it's about four light years, isn't it? Four yeah, four and a quarter light, light years to the yeah. next nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, and um, we're thousands of times less than that. So perhaps this might be a good time just to talk about um, measuring in um, space. So quite we, we often talk about light years. Can you say a bit more about what a light year is? What do we mean by that? Using miles or kilometers can be useful inside the solar system. But in general, in the solar system, we tend to use the average distance between the Earth and the sun which is 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers. And we call that one astronomical unit. And Jupiter orbits the sun at about 5.2 astronomical units. Um, Neptune at around about 30 astronomical units. Pluto on average about 40 astronomical units. But as I say, Voyager 2 has gone out to beyond 100 astronomical units. The light from the sun when it reaches the Earth has been traveling for eight minutes, 20 seconds. A light year is how far a ray of light travels in one year. Six million million miles or 10 million million kilometers. There is no star beyond the sun as close as that. The clearest star system, Alpha Centauri, is four and a quarter light years away, which is in round figures, 25 million million miles, or 40 million million kilometers. The stars you see in the night sky are typically, the brighter ones, a few tens of light years, a few hundred light years away, and there are one or two that are a few thousand light years away. But they are all in our galaxy, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years in diameter, and around about 20,000 light years thick at the center, it's a bit like two dinner plates laid face to face with a central bulge and tapering to the edge. The next nearest galaxies, the large and small Magellanic clouds, in round figures, are 200,000 light years away. And the next big galaxy, the Andromeda spiral, is two and a half million light years. So people often say to me, what's the furthest thing I can see with the unaided human eye? And the answer is, if you've got good eyesight, a really clear, dark night, so you're in the middle of a national park somewhere nice and dark, two and a half million light years, which is 15 million, million, million miles. That's a 15 followed by 18 zeros. It's a number so mind boggling big, it has no meaning. Even two and a half million light years doesn't have a lot of meaning, but it's a little bit easier to handle. And then when we go further out, we have galaxies and galaxy clusters 
which are hundreds of millions of light years, thousands of millions of light years. And the furthest galaxies seen by the Hubble Space Telescope are about 13,000 million light years distant, which means we're seeing them as they were 13,000 million years ago when the universe was in its infancy. And this is actually very useful because as we look further out in space, we look further back in time. Yes, we don't see things as they are now. We never can. But we can see them as they were increasing times ago. And this shows us how the universe has changed, how it's evolved over time. And this was very important back in the 1960s in showing us that we do not live in a steady state universe. We live in a universe that's changing, it's evolving. There were objects that existed when the universe was young, don't exist in the universe today. And the steady state theory could not explain that, which is why eventually it was ditched and the Big Bang theory became the preeminent theory for how our universe began and how it's evolved. But there's an awful lot of detail in that Big Bang theory that we don't know. And this is where the James Webb Space Telescope that was launched on Christmas Day last year is so exciting because the Hubble Space Telescope, which has a main mirror about eight feet across, 2.4 meters, has done an amazing job for over 30 years. It's rewritten the textbooks in every area, astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology, but there's a limit to how far back in time it can see around about 13,000 million light years. So when Hubble is looking at those very distant objects, we're seeing complete galaxies with stars. What we want to see are the very first stars and the very first galaxies that existed in our universe. And Hubble can't do that. The James Webb Space Telescope can for two reasons. Firstly, it's a lot bigger than Hubble, so it has a bigger light grasp than Hubble, and it has very, very sensitive instruments that can pick up incredibly faint light. But it's actually not looking at visible light, because in the 13,000 plus million years that the universe has been in existence, it's been expanding. And the light emitted from those very first galaxies has been stretched to longer and longer wavelengths. So you've got to look beyond red in the visible spectrum to see them in the infrared. And this is what the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do. It's a big infrared telescope. And with its light grasp and its sensitive instruments and its ability to see beyond red in the visible spectrum, we will hopefully see those very first stars and those very first galaxies. And I, I remember the things you remember in life, and they are, they have a real effect on you. And I remember going to a conference many years ago, and I wish I could remember who said it. There was an astronomer talking about the early universe and what we did and didn't know. And he said, for a long time, after the universe became transparent, it was filled with neutral gas. And then suddenly, the first stars and the first galaxies began to form. And it was as though the lights came on all over the universe. And that, to me, was an amazing thing. I sat and thought about that, that you were looking at this universe, which was dark, full of neutral gas, and then here and there, these stars were firing up. And what we want to know is, how did that happen? What triggered that? And why is the universe structured the way it is today? Because the universe has an incredible large scale structure. Galaxies form in clusters, but clusters of galaxies are not uniformly spread across the universe. They are in vast strings or walls. It's like a huge cosmic web with the clusters of galaxies along the web and in between ever expanding voids. Why is the universe structured like that? We don't know. Maybe James Webb will help us understand that. 
And to me, that's very exciting. Yes, I've certainly have been very excited that the James Webb has finally got off the ground. It's been in development for uh, for many well, tens a long of years. Time. Yeah, it's been a been long been time. Over a decade. Um, and I would very much recommend your um, your film that we put out today on space exploration. There's a lovely um, uh, set of images and videos of of how they they got the James Webb up there and how they've um, packed it away and then had to unfurl it and all the all the different engineering things that they've had to do in order to make it work. And I suppose one of it's the a miracle of engineering. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it is it is a real example of what humans can achieve when lots of people from many countries are combining their brain power and working together with a common goal. It's a great example of what we can do constructively rather than sadly what we can do destructively. And to me, it's an inspiration to see what people are capable of. And there is some truly amazing engineering in the James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be very exciting to see. I mean, the Hubble images that came back were just mind blowing. I mean, and this is going to be it's a step beyond Hubble. So it's going to be. Amazing. Ah, but we, we go back to something I said earlier. Yes. The James Webb Space Telescope images are not going to be like Hubble's in the sense that they will not be what you would see with the a human eye. Now, Hubble images vary. There are some that are visible light images. There are some that have ultraviolet, some that have a little bit of infrared, and some that are false colour, like the wonderful pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula. That is a false colour image. And the James Webb Space Telescope images, they will be infrared images, and they will not be like what you'd see with the naked eye. But you have to realise that in visible light, we wouldn't see what it is we want to see, because that light has been stretched so much to be on red in the visible spectrum. So when we do see the images, they will have been processed um, so that we yeah. can see them. Um, so they won't necessarily be what the instruments would be seeing and what's yeah. actually out there. So, um, but anyway, I, it'll be uh, it'll be fantastic to see or sort of see what uh, what it, what comes back. Um, which is very, very exciting. Um, we clearly have some people um, interested in asteroids. Um, because we have a question so many here. questions on asteroids. We do have lots of questions on asteroids. What is the type of asteroid that is most likely to hit Earth? And I think we've already talked about the fact that um, hopefully an asteroid wouldn't hit Earth because we would have this um, get together to try and prevent the asteroid from hitting the Earth. But in terms of the whether it be an iron or a chondrite, um, what sort of asteroids? We have to look at the meteorites that land on Earth you know, roughly 96% are chondritic, 4% or so, 3 to 4% are iron, and then the rest are rarer types. The most likely type of asteroid that's going to come our way is going to be stony, rocky material. Probably fairly low density, maybe 2 to 3 grams per cubic centimetre. But whether it is a rocky monolith, in other words, one piece of rock, or whether it's a rubble pile, that we don't know, because we're not too sure how many asteroids are rubble piles and how many are monoliths. And this is one of the things where um, uh, asteroid uh, missions, like, for example, we had the, the Japanese mission Hayabusa 2 that went to Ryugu. We had the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft that went to Bennu. Uh, both similar size city block size asteroid sorry city center size asteroids um, and the samples are coming back from Bennu we've got some samples already from Ryugu and these will help us understand how the asteroids are made because how you deal with a threat depends on what it's made of and how it's constituted but the most likely is that sort of um, that sort of rocky material Thank you. But people say to me, aren't you worried about the Earth being hit by an asteroid? No, not in the slightest. I'm far more worried about things going on on the Earth than I am about an asteroid coming from space. The good news is that the most likely sort of asteroid to hit us is going to be small. It's going to be between 100 and 150 metres across. And it's the sort of thing we can probably deal with. Um, we are discovering more and more of these asteroids all the time. 
we've probably at the moment discovered just less than half of the ones that may come our way, but there are people looking out all the time. There are robotic telescopes and astronomers scanning the skies, looking for these objects. Um, and yeah, we may be caught unawares, but you know we're doing the best we can. So asteroids, perhaps not something to worry about. Something you and I were discussing a little bit earlier was uh, this concept of space weather, mm. which um, has become more um, in the media and in, in awareness um, over the past few decades. So can you tell, tell us a bit, what is space? What do we mean by space weather? Okay, so, uh, earlier on, I mentioned sun being a star and sending out a stream of gas and electrically charged particles into space all the time. And we call that stream of particles a solar wind. It blows out from the sun from, um, and it's slowest, maybe a couple of hundred kilometers per second, and at fastest, maybe 2,000 kilometers per second. So you've got to view the solar wind as a bit like the winds we get here on Earth. We've had an awful lot of wind in the past week or so. And winds can blow smoothly, or they can be very gusty. Now you think back to Storm Eunice, we had very strong, steady winds of maybe 45, 55 miles an hour, but we had gusts of 80 to 90 miles an hour in the middle of that steady wind. Solar wind can do the same. You have a steady speed, but you get gustiness in it as well. Then you have the varying speed. You can have a gentle breeze, or you can have gale force or severe gale force, and the solar wind can blow the same. Now, the way the solar wind blows, the speed, gustiness, is down to the activity going on on the solar surface. The sun, of course, being a star, this giant ball of gas, very active, there's eruptions and explosions and changes in the magnetic field and twists and turns and eruptions going on all the time. Some of them rather minor, some of them fairly major. Now, many of them, when they happen, push material out into space that misses the Earth completely. You've got to realize that at a distance of 93 million miles, we're a fairly small target area. So when the sun has an eruption and throws stuff out into space, it's most likely it's going to miss us completely. It might hit us a glancing blow, and rarely it might hit us full on. Now, the Earth is continually bathed in a stream of solar wind, and those particles come into the Earth's magnetic field, some are trapped in the Earth's radiation belts, and some are funneled down towards the North and South magnetic poles, where they produce glowing rings, the aurora borealis around the Arctic, and the aurora australis around the Antarctic. But we're concerned about space weather, because when you get a really major burst in the solar wind, and it's very high speed or it's very gusty, it really disturbs the Earth's magnetic field. And if you think of a wind sock on an airfield being blown by the wind, the Earth's magnetic field is just like that. And the solar wind blows the Earth's magnetic field and buffets it like a wind sock on an airfield. And when you get a really major burst in the solar wind, the Earth's magnetic field is sent into, uh, you know, a lot of activity, and we get what's called a geomagnetic storm. And in a geomagnetic storm, electrical currents created by these particles coming into the atmosphere come down to ground level. And those electrical currents can do all sorts of things. They can knock out electricity supply systems, as happened in Quebec province, on the 13th of March, 1989, in the great geomagnetic storm of that day, Quebec province was backed out for nine hours. And these days, electricity supply companies get predictions of possible geomagnetic storms and can put the electricity supply system in a way in which it's not so easily affected. But as our society becomes more reliant on the internet, on electronic technology, on computer technology, we perhaps lay ourselves open to being more vulnerable to a really major solar storm and a big burst in solar wind. And the generic term that we give for 
all the effects associated with the variability in the solar wind and the geomagnetic storms they occur, the generic term is space weather. And if you go back 50 years, hardly anyone was talking about it. Nowadays, it's become a multi-billion dollar business. Predicting space weather has become vitally important because we have thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth doing incredibly important jobs. And space weather, the solar wind, affect those satellites. If you think back to the 1st of February this year, SpaceX launched 49 Starlink satellites. 49 of them came down prematurely because of a solar storm that day. So it is very important for satellite companies, people operating satellites, to know when we're going to get some serious space weather to be able to put the spacecraft perhaps in a safe mode, a protective mode, but also for people who run uh, large computer networks, storage systems, clouds, that sort of thing. Clouds, I mean, store cloud storage, not clouds in the atmosphere, to understand how space weather might affect them. And so it is becoming increasingly important as our society becomes more dependent on electronic and computer technology. I imagine it, it also it's also important for when astronauts go up into the atmosphere and are up at the International Space Station, or obviously once we start going back to the moon and potentially onto Mars, that, that it will also Indeed. be relevant. We um, already have the situation that, for example, if you had a really, really major solar flare and there was an enormous burst of electrically charged particles, there is a part of the International Space Station where the astronauts can seek refuge, where they're shielded by a lot of metal from the direction the particles are coming from. On the surface of the moon or Mars, you would have no such protection. The radiation would come right down to the surface. There's no atmosphere and no magnetic field today on either of them. So it's going to be very important to look at the radiation hazard posed by the sun and space weather in future exploration, both on the moon and Mars, we will have to have refuges where astronauts can go should there be a space weather event. We were lucky during the Apollo moon landings, the missions were relatively short, generally a week or so, uh, and we were lucky that there were no really major solar events during that time. Yes, yeah, and um, so we're now back into space exploration. And um, one of the, the questions that I'm sure you often get asked is um, what about alien life? Um, where do, would, does alien life exist? Um, how do we know that it might exist? Where might it exist? I mean, I can't, I can't obviously prove to you that aliens exist because there is no scientific evidence that they do. But I personally believe that there is life everywhere in the universe. And I believe that in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, that's the only area we're exploring really, we have already discovered thousands of planets going round other stars. Now, if you go back just over a quarter of a century, the only planetary system we knew was the one we lived in. The only planets we knew were the eight in our solar system, or nine as it was then before Pluto was taken to the dwarf planet. But now we know of you know, four and a half thousand other planets in thousands of planetary systems in our own galaxy, extending out to a thousand light years or so from where the sun is located. And we're learning more and more about what those planetary systems are like. And the vast majority are nothing like ours. And many of the planets in those planetary systems are nothing like the ones in our solar system. But there are planets very similar to the Earth, similar in size, similar in mass. Now, at the right distance from their parent star, that the temperature could have liquid water on the surface if the atmosphere was the right density and the surface pressure right. So there's a lot of variables, and we're beginning to learn about what those planets might be like. But all that would tell us is, are their conditions suitable for life to exist? Are there conditions on that planet suitable for life to have evolved as it did on the Earth? And this is something that is going to be an ongoing project way into the future. 
as we discover more and more planets, as we learn more and more about them, we're going to say, OK, over here around this star, there is a planet that does have all the conditions necessary for life. It is the right temperature. It appears to have an atmosphere. It may have oceans on the surface. We may even be able to work out what the atmosphere is made of. And we may then have a lot of clues as to whether there could be life there. But because of the enormous distance of these objects, we're not really going to be able to say, what is the life like? And although we're listening into space for anybody else sending us radio signals, we haven't found any conclusive proof that anyone else is sending us radio signals uh, from their planet out into space. We, of course, are sending radio signals out into space, beginning with the very first radio broadcasts and then the first TV broadcasts in the early 1960s. There is this expanding shell of radio waves moving out at the speed of light from our planet. Now, any civilization that had enormously sensitive receivers that could pick up these signals, all they would see what the, the star we call the sun has these signals coming from it. And they would perhaps surmise, ah, there's a planet going around that star that has a life form on it that is producing these radio emissions. Uh, and that sphere of uh, radio emissions is traveling outwards. So here we are, you know, in 2022, and uh, anyone with a very sensitive receiver that's 50 light years away could be listening to very old episodes of Coronation Street, for example. I'm sure they're enjoying them immensely. But the fact is that um, although we can say there's lots of places life might exist, lots of places life could evolve, it's going to be hard for us to work out what that life might be like, even though we can pinpoint perhaps many places which would be suitable for life to evolve. But I do believe, of course, that on our own planet, it is simple microbial life that is most common. You know, advanced creatures like animals are much rarer. And so it's probably the case that simple microbial life will be the most common elsewhere in the planets that we find, and that advanced beings and beings capable of communicating may be very rare. We don't know. Again, we've only got a sample of one, but the fact is it, it's probably the case that they are rare. Because when we look out into space and we listen, it's not immediately obvious that there's anybody else sending us intelligent radio signals. So clearly they're either a very long way away in our galaxy and the signals are so attenuated we can't detect them, uh, or maybe they're not there. So possibly no United Federation of Planets for a little while then. Well, no. No, United Federation of um, Beings on Earth would be quite nice. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so we were we were talking a little bit earlier about some science fiction. You mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson's um, Mars series. What what um, what sort of science fiction do you enjoy? Um, I've read most things over my life. Um, obviously started off with Arthur C. Clarke, as many people did. I went to the cinema to see 2001 when it first came out, and there were still bits of it. I'm not too sure I understand, but there we are. That's the same with anybody. Um, and I, and I, I do like you know, science fiction, Star Trek, some of it, um, Star Wars, the films. Um, there are lots of science fiction things I like, both written and um, movies. And um, yeah, yeah, I always uh, view it with interest. Sometimes when they go to a lot of bother to do things and then they make simple elementary mistakes, that annoys me because I think they've gone to all this bother to get all this right. Why didn't they do that one thing to make that right? And it annoys the hell out of my wife who always says, oh, you're picking holes in it. But actually, I, I love it. And, 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 then, and when you go and see something like Star Wars or Star Trek, I, I don't I don't view it with any great uh, detail or looking at things that about it. I, I just enjoy it as a bit of escapism. And, you know, some of the things that were predicted um, 
have come true. And, um, you know, Arthur C. Clarke predicted communication satellites in 1948. They became a reality in the 1960s. And, um, you know, the, uh, 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 encircling the Earth with a giant wheel with towers going up, the space elevator. Well, maybe that will happen one day. Uh, bases on the moon, of course, and, and, and space stations, bases on Mars, they will all happen within the present century, I'm quite sure. Yes, I certainly grew up um, absolutely adoring Star Trek and uh, being very inspired by it. Would you say that, that Science Fit, you found it inspiring to your career as an astronomer? No, I, I wouldn't say I was inspired by science fiction um, necessarily. I, I found it interesting. I found the ideas interesting. Um, I thought they were a good ways of, of Isaac Asimov and his laws of robotics, for example, and things like that. And I thought, well, actually, yeah, this is the way things will have to be. And, and there's a lot of very good core principles laid down uh, by, by these, um, these writers. So yes, I, I enjoyed reading and, and, and those, looking at those things. But it's interesting. I, I, Finished watching the um, the series of uh, Star Trek Enterprise with uh, Jonathan Archer and his crew, and um, and if you watch the original Star Trek series, you realise how it, incredibly dated it looks. You know, the scenery wobbles as the doors open. And that's part of its joy and appeal because you can't look at it through the eyes of 2020. You but you've got to look at it as the way it was made all those years ago, and. Uh, you know, the concepts then that they were putting forward were quite far reaching. I mean, Gene Roddenberry was, Gene Roddenberry was a visionary. And, uh, you know, many of his ideas were, were you know, really, really interesting and, and, and you know, quite important uh, in the same way. I suppose you could say George Lucas in the same way, had a vision and brought it to the big screen. And uh, lots of aspects of that, I'm sure, will also, also be true. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of my favourite um, movies in recent years has been The Martian. I did oh, uh, that's really enjoy that. extremely movie. good. Yeah. But again, you know, I, I, The Martian is a fantastic film. It's brilliantly played, brilliantly put together, very, very accurate, except for the very, very beginning and the very, very end. And again, I was thinking to myself, you went to all this bother of getting everything so right, but you know, if just you could, if you could just have got the bit at the beginning and the bit at the end right, it would have been a perfect film. But I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I love that film. So um, we've had a couple of questions coming in. Um, so obviously you're an astronomer and um, you've had this. Well, actually, I was a physicist okay. when I started. And then I became astrophysicist, geophysicist um, afterwards. Um, and um, I've, I've obviously studied many, many things in my long career. I'm effectively supposed to be retired now, and I, I seem to be working harder than I was before. But um, uh, so, so I started off as a physicist and applied physicist, and then astrophysics and geophysics became, became my thing, really. Fabulous. And I think we were talking earlier that um, obviously there are career paths in astronomy, astrophysics, geophysics, but you don't have to have a telescope to get out there and enjoy the night sky at all. In fact, it's almost better sometimes not to have a telescope. You can just really appreciate what is up there. And I would definitely recommend your video on the winter night sky tour um, to, to as a start to get out there and start looking around at the wonderful constellations that are out there um, as we speak above our heads. Um, and a question that has come in, however, is do you have a favorite star in the sky and why? Okay, well, let's just go back to what you said to start. It's very important to, what you said is very important. You don't need a telescope to get started in astronomy. In fact, it's probably a disaster to get a telescope when you start. You need to get a telescope a little bit down the line when you got into the subject, when you know a little bit about it, and you then can think about what sort of telescope will work best for you. And the other thing that I get all the time is, oh, I can't do anything with astronomy. I'm no good at mathematics. This is, you know, you don't need to have any knowledge of mathematics to be able to really get into astronomy and space exploration. And 
you mentioned the video I made, the tour of the winter night sky. That was entirely done with the human eye. And when I started out, and I became interested in astronomy at the age of seven, when I started out, I only had my eye. Um, and, you know, I was sitting in a deck chair with a star map and a red torch, and I would learn my way around the sky. And I taught myself a new constellation every clear night. And obviously, during the night, as the sky moves, the constellations change. And during the year, as the Earth go around the sun, so the constellations change. So by the time you've gone through a year, you've forgotten the things you learned first time, you go back and do it again. And it took me many years to learn my way around the sky. And then I bought a pair of binoculars with the money that I made from my paper round. And uh, I went to a, one of these shops in Portsmouth, which was an ex-war department, where they had all this X stuff from battleships and goodness knows what. I bought a pair of binoculars. I still have them. And uh, they were fantastic binoculars, seven by fifties. And um, I used those binoculars for years, learning my way around the binocular sky and looking at interesting objects. And it was only later when I was a teenager that I actually got a telescope. I was very lucky. Um, my father and some friends of his uh, made the telescope for me. And I was incredibly lucky that my parents had realized this was quite a big thing for me and that you know, they would go to bed and leave me sitting in a deck chair in the garden learning my way around the sky, you know, even when I was 10 years old um, and, um, and, and trusted me to do this. However, can be bad for your health. On two occasions, what I ended up in A&E in the early hours of the morning. My parents would hear an enormous crash. They would come and find me underneath my bed, having smashed either one of my two eyebrows on the cast iron under bit of the bed. Because what would happen is I would, I always wanted to get up early because you find that the best skies are often four or five in the morning. So I would set my alarm clock and it had one of these with a big bell on the top. And as the hammer came back, there was a click and I would wake up and I could put my hand between the hammer and the bell without the bell going off, except on those two occasions. Because I swiped the alarm clock off and it went off under the bed and I followed it in a swooping dive to grab it, smashing my head on two occasions on either eyebrow on the cast iron under the bed, which of course woke up the household and ended up in the trip to A&E to be stitched up. So yes, I was very keen, but I would say to people, the early morning sky is often when it's a lot clearer. A lot of the lights that are on in the evening and later go out. A lot of the muck in the atmosphere settles out during the night. And if you get up at four or five in the morning when it's clear, you get an amazing view of the sky. And at the moment, if you're an early riser, Venus is fantastic. In the southeast at the moment, about quarter past six, Venus is shining like a lamp in the twilight. It's a fabulous sight. And a little bit below it, very faint, is the red planet Mars. And you want to look at that now. You can hardly see it. You can see it in binoculars. But by the end of this year, it'll be one of the brightest objects in the sky because the brightness of Mars varies enormously as it goes around the sun. So, you know, there are lots of things to learn with nothing more than the number one eyeball. and your eyes are a brilliant thing to learn your way around the sky. And it's very important. It's like when you go and explore a new city. You get a guidebook, you get a map, and you start learning where things are in a city and you find your way around. You need to do that to get the most out of the night sky. You need to know where things are. You need to know what there is up there before you can really start to enjoy it. And that's why you don't get a telescope to start with, because if you've learned your way round and you're familiar with it, then when you get a telescope, you will know the things you want to look at and you will have a realistic view of what you're going to see when you look through the eyepiece. Because you won't see Jupiter the size of a dinner plate. It will be small and you'll see the detail and you'll realise that on a really clear night, it's amazing, but many of the nights are rather unsteady and you won't see so much. 
So being realistic about what you're gonna see, you only learn with experience and with time. So take the time to learn your way around the sky, learn the stars, learn the constellations, get a pair of binoculars, then maybe get a small telescope. And you don't need an electronically complicated computer controlled one. You don't need one. Very small telescopes that are sold in camera shops and in adverts in the back of Sunday newspapers, don't touch them with a barge pole. You need to get a decent telescope and there is no good thing as a good, cheap telescope. They're either good or they're cheap. If you're gonna invest in a telescope, you need to buy a good one and you need to spend probably a few hundred pounds to do that. But you only wanna do that when you're sure that you're really interested in this hobby and you wanna go further. Great, I think that's uh, that's very wise advice indeed. And uh, I would absolutely recommend people get out there um, get out to our dark sky discovery sites. There's mm. lots of information about that on our website. Um, it's wonderful to get out there in the dark sky to see the Milky Way, um, to figure out where the North Star is. Um, at the moment, or, I mean, I love Orion. It's it's a fabulous constellation. Um, and yeah, just get out there and 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 enjoy yourselves. I mean, there's just and there's just some wonderful things to see, like you say, with the naked eye, perhaps with a pair of binoculars. Once you you know a bit more. Um, so we do have just time just for one final question, and that is, um, which astronomer do you think made the biggest advances in our understanding of the universe? It's a fairly big question. <laughs> I don't know if you can say fairly quickly what, uh, what you think. I'm not going to say, and the reason is, astronomy and astrophysics is about teamwork. The James Webb Space Telescope has only come to fruition with the effort of thousands of scientists, engineers, astronomers spread across the world. Everybody can make a contribution, but when you're a member of a team, you are able to make a contribution far bigger than you could on your own. Yes, there are people going right back to Galileo, Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, William Herschel, many, many others who made big advances at the time. But that is the way astronomy was then. It's now a very different thing. You can be an amateur astronomer and you can make contributions because there's lots and lots of projects you can get involved in with your own telescope. If you're part of a club, again, you're part of a team. And if you're a professional astronomer, Working at a university, you'll be part of a team and you won't contribute as much on your own as you will as part of that team. So it is teamwork that makes the big developments in all science, but particularly astronomy and astrophysics. Thank you, Dr. John. That's a really wonderful point um, to end on. Thank you so much um, for answering all these questions. There was quite a few coming at you there. We've covered quite <laughs> a lot of space, <laughs> if I can use that, uh, use that term. And thank you to all of you um, who have been joining us, um, who have sent in your questions. Um, it's been really wonderful to be able to do this. Uh, thank you very much. Go out and enjoy the night sky, embrace the darkness, and good night. Good night.